thanks, thanks for coming today. Uh, there's a there's a group of us up here, um, as you can see, and uh, we've got a a talk on uh, uh, probably one of the most interesting projects that I've worked on in my career. Um, it's a, a new prison campus um, that is going up right now. Actually, we're kind of putting the uh, dotting the I's and crossing the T's of it, if you will, um, and it's going up right just uh, west of the airport in Salt Lake City, Utah. A uh, little housekeeping here to start with. Um, you will get AIA credits for uh, listening to us, um, and it's also copyrighted by the AIA. Uh, course description, this is the same thing that is in the uh, conference program, so uh, that's probably why you're here. Um, I, want to do, I do want to touch on the learning objectives. Um, we will go through uh, basically four, four things that, that I'm hoping you um, come away with some good, some good tidbits. Uh, the first is just an overview of the project, um, the design, a little bit of the history. Uh, we're also going to talk about uh, the complex nature. So what things you know, should you be thinking about when you're designing one of these facilities? And, and from my perspective, these are some of the most complicated buildings that I've ever been involved in. Um, and then uh, we, we, we took a, a, a unique approach um, to, to make sure that we had commissioning resources to be able to do the project because when this thing came online, we needed all the commissioning resource, local commissioning resources to be lined up and doing the work. So uh, we, were, we are actually the commissioning management team, not the commissioning team, the commissioning management team. So we'll talk about that commissioning management approach. And then um, the last little bit is uh, how we are applying uh, fault, det uh, fault detection and diagnostic software on the project and, and, and some lessons learned around that and how we're driving value from that. Uh, moving into um, who, who's up here? David Myers. David, David is the director of commissioning for Burns and McDonald. Uh, David's going to give you the overview of the project and um, some of the history and background. Steve, Steve Haynes, um, Steve, Steve's actually one of our commissioning managers that uh, boots on the ground and is actually living this project day to day. And I'm not exactly sure how Steve got here because we're in the middle of the final two months of this project right now and somebody let him come here, but good for Steve, bad for them. Uh, and then uh, I'm, I'm Greg Schlegel um, and I'm uh, with uh, Bernard and I was highly involved during the design phase of the project. As we moved into the construction phase of the project, I handed it over to Steve, Steve's counterpart on the ground, Todd Jakes as well, who's, who's not here, who's holding down the fort back in Salt Lake. Um, and then I'm getting more involved again now as we're deploying analytics, as that's, that's one of my core specialties. And then last but not least, Vince Van Oostenburg. I was like saying, yeah, I like saying Vince's last name, even if I mess it up. Uh, Vince is providing a lot of technical support um, for the commissioning team, and he is a director of commissioning with Bernard. With that, I'll pass it over to David. Thank you, Greg. Well, first, you get a history lesson, right? 1951 is the prison, when the prison was built, that is this, our prison is replacing. 1951, uh, Harry S. Truman was president. World War II just ended. Um, our grandfathers were building buildings using slide rules um, and rules of thumb. Um, some of the buildings do not have air conditioning in it. And uh, it was time for an upgrade. Um, not only was it time for an upgrade for the buildings itself, but it was a time for, because the land is also very valuable right now because it once was a, was out in the middle of nowhere and now has a bunch of residents and and a bunch of uh, people living around around the prison. So um, Salt Lake, uh, the state of Utah decided to, to design a prison uh, and put it basically in the middle of a, a swamp um, or middle of the Salt Lake or the dried up Salt Lake um, using a big project team. Um, there's a lot of folks on here um, that were involved from the start. We got, we got involved and were selected um, I don't know, about 30% design, I think it was? 30% design, so it's probably right time for the commissioning agent to be involved, or, although you kind of want to be in there before the, before the architects actually got pen to paper, but you know, it was close. Um, they had a few starts and stops in the program originally to get it going, but um, finally um, it did. Um, Greg and I were just talking the fact that we were a lot younger when this thing actually started. Um, 
So the prison itself, I mean, you have a huge, huge complex, right? So you've got 135 acres um, of, of buildings and 31 different buildings, lots of different types of buildings. Um, like Greg said, it took a lot of commissioning agents. We're the commissioning management firm. There's three other firms that are involved with the project, uh, doing boots in the ground, functional testing um, of the facility. Um, so we were involved in the design phase. We wrote um, some of the documentation for the projects. The commissioning teams were there, boots in the ground, to implement the functional testing as well as doing some of the checkout reviews of the, of the project. But lots of different, different types of buildings, lots of different types of specialties. Um, strange systems that you you wouldn't see in any other place but here and we'll go more into that um, as we go further on into the presentation so this little movie slide to really get an idea of what uh, this facility really looks like once again um, 135 acres right and the site's a lot big so you had to bring in all of your utilities brand new right from from the street um, and it's a long way in the middle of a, of a marshland. And to give you an idea, we were, we were sitting around, right, we start the project, and they are talking about how they lost one of the pieces of equipment. So the piece of equipment drove off the road, broke into the, the swamp land, and it disappeared underneath the muck. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on here. New utility line, two substations, um, or one substation fed by two sources. Um, having definitely have redundancy here. Lots of buildings going up. This is all. This is also also being worked on during the pandemic. I don't think you guys stopped at all, did you? No. Um, it is a uh, probably about a year past when it was supposed to be turned over. I was looking at the OPR before I started this presentation, and it, it said that the turnover date was uh, April 2021. So um, not too far behind. So once again, talking about. Um, the different occupants of the prison, right? 24-7 operations, you've got um, over 3,000 3, 3, inmates, I think it was? 3,600 3, 3, 3, beds in this facility. So lots of different types of uh, security protocols, lots of different types of people, lots of different types of spaces from food service to medicals. I mean, you med gas, you've got a new central utility plant, you've got warehousing, manufacturing, all these types of different facilities all in one in one area. And, and you have to then control them differently, right? So we did have an OPR charrette. Um, I was heavily involved in the beginning of the project, not so much during when, when Steve took it over. Uh, I was less involved, sort of like Greg um, but we did have one, and it's always the weird things in the OPR shreds that, uh, that stand out to you, right? So one of the questions um, was address, right? Because you, you didn't actually have a postal address to the site. You know, what was that going to be? Um, there was a um, very interesting conversation about controls. So at a prison, you've got a lot of free labor, right? So, um, and there were some folks on the utility staff that knew how to program PLCs. So the owner wanted everything to be done with PLCs. Uh, the designer, 30% through, thought that was just a joke and was doing everything back net. Um, long conversation, sort of met them midway. Some stuff is, is Niagara, um, some stuff is PLCs. Uh, depending on what you have in the buildings, but it was a very interesting conversation when the designer all of a sudden realized was like, "Whoa, wait! You actually do want PLCs in this building?" Uh, so, you know, it was a it's a two-day session that we had, uh, ran through the the basic design, make sure they had all the questions answered. The state of Utah, I think they've changed it, but they used to have a a big spreadsheet, a long, a long Word document, which had questions in there for the OPR. And we went through each one of them in the charrette and pulled the information out from um, the designers working on the project as well as from the different stakeholders within, within the state of Utah. Site prep, really interesting here. You, you, you know, I know you don't usually commission sites, but this is, was really cool, so we thought I'd mention it. You've got you know, everything is sitting basically floating on, on, on marshland, right? So you think 135 acres, four inches of fill, right, over the entire site just to compress it. And before that fill got, got moved over the entire site, it was in 20-foot 
piles. So those piles are 20 foot high. They're where all the different buildings sit and it, it's compressing down the site. Now to do that, you also need wicks, right? So that little, that little contraption there is drilling holes in, in the site, um, drilling through the crust layer, putting in wicks. So as this thing goes down, the water can have somewhere to go out, right? So it's, uh, it's, it's your, you're in the middle of a swamp. It's, it was actually really kind of cool. So site utilities, so uh, you guys can read. We um, you know, brought all the site utilities in, we functionally tested all the systems. Um, you know, you've got, you've got your, your water storage on site, you've got utilities on site, it's all got redundancy to it. Uh, another conversation at the OPR was, is really the, the power migration scheme as you as you lose power to the site how you know what systems are maintaining power because you can imagine a prison right you can't just turn everything off you've got to have some systems that stay operational and as you start to lose generators you know you're going to have certain systems that stay locked because you don't want to let your prisoners out right and some some areas you can let them out to the yard and some areas you can't so it's all combined with the security systems it's um, it's a really interesting, complex, complex project, right? So, um, you know, as we were listening to the, the uh, NIDA presentation that was just done uh, um, last session, it kind of rang bells here because um, there was lots of conversation about commissioning and commissioning of substations and what the commissioning spec was and verbiage saying commissioning because it meant different things to the substation the substation folks that it did to us as commissioning managers and um, and spelling out what each person was supposed to be doing and they had assumed at one point that they were that we were the ones doing the startup and, and testing and, and needed testing to the substation which was not correct. Um, and it was very interesting, once again, going through that, that language barrier that's out there. And as, as everyone learned in that, se in that session, that was just a, a few hours ago. Um, so getting got, got it from the site, now we're getting into the building systems. Um, you know, enclosure commissioning, security commissioning was all part of this project too. Um, we, we didn't have those in-house, we managed those as well. Um, those were separate contracts with the owner. Uh, so these are some of the systems that we dealt with the entire, on the entire project, right? Um, and you can also imagine a complex, there's lots of systems. There are, there are lots of networks. I know this is kind of an eye chart, but um, it just tells you the variety of different systems, different networks, different things that had to be coordinated um, throughout the entire process so that the prison can get to the end where it is right now. We start doing the blackout tests that everything worked properly. As we, as we bring prisoners in, which, which is actually a year earlier than expected, um, we actually thought we had a year to ring out some of the facilities while we, while we um, before they migrated folks in, but that seems like it's happening sooner, and, and the folks here, um, uh, my colleagues will, will talk more about that as we get more into the systems. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, Vince, who's gonna talk to you more in depth about the different types of mechanical systems. Thanks, David. Um, which button is one? Uh, the arrow button. Cool. Other one. Oh. There you go. All right. Um, first of all, who's been to prison? <laughs> Matthew, right? Yeah. So, um, I've been in more prisons than I care to remember. Uh, this one has been pretty unique, and if, if anybody has ever been into one, whether it's a new build or an existing, um, there's no pretty way to put it, but they, they stink. Right, when you get a lot of people put together in a, in, a, in a single spot that can't leave, you know, they live there, they, they um, you know, they eat there and what have you. So one of the unique things and the challenges and, you know, kind of, I might have this a little bit out of order, um, but there's, there's a reason for it. So um, we live in a desert climate, right? As David had mentioned earlier before, we have, um, these buildings need a high outside ventilation load, right? Salt Lake will see some pretty extreme weathers from extremely hot to really cold, right? Um, as we continue to talk about a little bit about decarbonization, um, how, do we, how do we manage our discharge air temperatures? How do we manage our, our space temperatures? So this just kind of gives you an out, you know, of a schematic of one of the particular units. It's called an IDEC unit. 
And um, show of hands if anybody knows what IDAC. Okay, so this is something typically you will find in the desert, right? Um, you will have a hot water coil, obviously, for your heating season. This particular one actually has a what we call a cooling coil because in this particular facility there is no chilled water, right? So what we're doing is we're basically using plate and frames, a couple cooling towers, and then running out with just the cooling water out to this coil. Next one you see in line here is what they call a direct coil, and that is just dropping water across a media, and then you're picking up that um, cold temperature as it goes across. Um, if you were to lose water, or when you get into certain parts of the, the season when we do get some rainstorms, we'll have a DX to actually dehumidify. So from there, it just kind of flows all in, and it's, um, yeah, it works. The, the sequences for this, you know, from a commissioning standpoint, from a design review, from a, a talking with, with your um, design engineers is making sure that this works. So let me jump a little bit. Um, anybody do cooking? Because if you're, you're in there and you're making a salsa, you're, you're cutting up your peppers and all of a sudden you sneeze and you touch your eyes, right? Your eyes burn. Another reason why I want high outside air. So what this is, it's a, um, it's a gas that's extremely sticky, and what it's used for is during riot control. And so <clears throat> it'll happen, right? Inmates get a little rowdy, you need to break them up. How do you do that without going in, right? Back to the security thing that David talked a little bit about is when you release this, you need to shut down that room. So if there was a riot in here, because you guys aren't liking the presentation, right? We've got to keep you in, but you're all getting a little rowdy, so what do we do? The security is going to release this gas into the, into the space. It's going to just irritate your skin, your eyes, you can't breathe, and you just kind of submiss and go back to your cell. So having said that, right, what takes priority? It's a prison, right? Everybody thinks security is pretty, pretty top, right? So when you're talking through some of the sequences with the designers, you really got to start thinking. So most of us will do a normal day, it's BAS and fire. How do those two integrate, right? Now we're going to have the complexity of we have fire, we have smoke control, we now have the security for OC gas, and then we have our normal BAS operations, right? And how do each one of those talk to each other through the network? Just to give you an idea, <clears throat> so this is just a short wing of one of the um, facilities that's out there. So right here I've got three different day rooms, but this is a complete smoke compartment, okay? So 100% um, outside air, one air handler supplies all three of these, all right? And then, where's our pointer? So I'm gonna talk about this one. That's, this is called a day room, right? So you've got three different day rooms. So in this particular, right here, right? You could have a riot control going on and you need all of these smoke dampers to shut while maintaining air pressurization to this so you don't, you don't come, you know, you don't bring that into another spot, right? And so all of your sequences that you now have through your BAS need to work. You gotta shut off your fans, all your cell exhaust fans in here so that you don't accidentally suck all that um, gas that you just released, right? And then once everybody's controlled and everybody's back in their, you know, in their spot, then what happens is, is now you open up your supply and your exhaust, including this one right here, which is your supply exhaust, or your smoke exhaust and your smoke supply. And these are 100% outside air, untreated, and you blow it in until you get to a certain spot and now the security will release their OC gas and you go back to normal um, operation. That being said, if this is in riot control and this guy over here decides to start a fire, this all goes into a smoke control, right? So now it overrides your security, overrides your um, fire, it goes into total smoke control. Kind of a little bit of broken up, or sorry, a little bit of clearer spot just to give you an idea. Even though this does show that people can egress, right? There's 32 people in this pod, 32 and 32. So that's a lot of people. Let's talk a little bit about 
how we did this. So we sat down with the design engineer and then rather than having a long narrative where the controls contractors got to sit and read it and discern it and figure out what starts, what stops, right? We really came down with this kind of table matrix and said, okay, in what zone, or sorry, what day room, what happens? What shuts off? What turns on? What closes, right? And you talk about, you know, what's the air handler do? What do the supply smoke exhaust do? What do the dampers do? Right, VAV, do they stay on, do they close? And then what happens to your cell exhaust, right? And this is kind of for every single thing. So, you know, like we said, we've got 30 different buildings. There's one of these for every single building. Talk a little bit about, you know, going back to the day room just to kind of highlight that, you know, this is what it is. And then th it is a two level, right? Same thing happens, right? If I go back to that picture that I, or the, the diagram I just showed you with the three day rooms, Right, if this is in smoke, or sorry, if this is in, in a riot control, the other two are working still normally, still supplying air, still ventilating, still maintaining temperature. Right, same thing again, smoking, you know, for chemical, what happens? Right, so you kind of have to overlay your BAS, what happens in normal operation, what happens in smoke control, now what happens in chemical. This is all controlled, for chemical, it's all controlled by the security system. So when you start talking to your trades, how are you going to integrate? How are you gonna you know, talk to the, the fire panel? How are you gonna talk to your BAS? What security? So you really gotta start thinking through when you do your design reviews um, in the very beginning, you know, is there any scope gaps in your specs, right? Is everybody at the same table? Does everybody have the same idea on how things are gonna operate? And then with that, I'll give it to Steve. Thanks, Vince. Um, so I'm Steve Haynes from Salt Lake. Um, it's been my pleasure, my great pleasure to be daily involved with this project for the last three years on site in this swamp next to the Great Salt Lake, which uh, it smells most of the most of the year. <laughs> yeah, we have to figure out something better for you to do next. <laughs> yeah, but I appreciate let them let you know give me the opportunity to get a prism at least for the uh, for a few well, days here. Okay. <clears throat> so I've been involved. Let's see, is it this button? No, it's the other button. With the project uh, for about three years. I'm from Salt Lake, so Burns and Mac recruited me to come come uh, manage the commissioning project. I hear the prison. <clears throat> so I've been involved, not entirely from the beginning, but almost at the beginning. But uh, even though this is a, a very large, complicated project, in many ways um, it follows you know, the standard commissioning process. There are some specialized uh, features that we um, developed along the way as well. But a lot of it was uh, you know, kind of run-of-the-mill commissioning. We, we, as David talked about, the first thing we did was met with the owners, with the uh, state officials, with the Department of Correction officials, um, and other stakeholders to develop their requirements, their desires for each of the 30-plus uh, buildings on this campus, you know, lay it out to determine uh, how exactly they want to use the campus and the, and the specific access controls that are uh, critical to the functioning of the facility. Um, we also helps help the owner uh, develop this unique method of uh, delivering the commissioning um, uh, the commissioning team that David mentioned earlier as well um, our two companies acted as the commissioning managers um, and then the state uh, later in the project would hire three uh, dedicated uh, commissioning firms to provide the boots on the ground manpower when it came to that point so but at, at the initiation of this project it was our job to um, familiarize ourselves with the teams, uh, integrate ourselves with the owner's team, the owner's consultant, the designers, the contractors, the prison officials, and to really get a good knowledge of, of how uh, things were working. Um, <clears throat> we learned the, uh, the uh, software, the platforms, the processes, all in, all in an effort so that when the commissioning agents came on, we could we could give them very good direction, integrate them right away, so they would hit the ground running with their testing. Um, we provided leadership for the project. 
uh, for the uh, commissioning side. We um, implemented the commissioning platform as well as developed the uh, draft commissioning plans, the uh, specifications. Uh, we also wrote the functional performance test, the checklists, and all of the other commissioning documentation you would normally see on a commissioning project. We took care of that on the front side and then turned it over to the commissioning agents when they, when they were hired. Um, we also developed communication plans, the meeting schedules, the milestones and deliverables. We fed all that information up to the general contractor's schedule, um, which was a challenge in itself. It was a, it was a pretty daunting schedule. I think it was three, 400 pages every time they issued it. It was, it was an amazingly long schedule. Um, we also worked to ensure that uh, we had the capacity to implement the uh, fault detection software platform um, with the uh, networks that were available and we helped the owner establish you know, criteria for turning over the buildings. So as the commissioning management team, we really played a central role in the, in the project. We worked daily with the owner's team. Um, you can see on this chart, there's a project program manager, a BDK, that's a, that's a joint venture between Big D, which is a local uh, contracting firm, and Kitchell, uh, who I think are out of Arizona. Anyway, they acted as the project managers and um, the owner's consultant for the project. They really were the owner's representative. Um, we also work with the state. DFC, DFCM is the uh, Utah State Department of uh, Construction and Management, as well as we work directly with the, uh, <coughs> the operator, the Department of Corrections. And we, of course, communicated directly with the contracting team and the design team. And as David mentioned earlier as well, there was a separate uh, commissioning firm for the security systems and the building closure. Those were held by uh, separate contracts with the state. Uh, and even though they were separate and didn't report directly to us, we of course uh, kept them involved in our discussion so that we were all well coordinated. Uh, they were they weren't on a, they were not on site. Excuse me. The security firm was on site all the time. You can imagine the building envelope. Uh, they showed up when they need to. So uh, we played a central role in coordinating that effort as well. See if I can get the right button. Uh, so, on the commissioning team, really, it was myself and Todd Jakes. You can see here on the right, he's my partner in crime, holding down the fort while I'm gone. Um, we have been dedicated to this uh, project daily for three years. Um, you can see here this graph represents uh, the entities that we work directly with the state project managers, the project, internal project executives, their remote subject matter experts, our uh, owner's uh, representative group, and the uh, general contractor's uh, commissioning coordinator. And then on the bottom here, we have three local commissioning firms <clears throat> who were providing the boots on the ground functional testing. So as a commissioning management team, we provided uh, uh, leadership for this process. We developed a consistent program and similar documentation for each of the 30 buildings. And, and handed those documents off to the commissioning firms, these commissioning agent firms, um, to use. And we, and we did that at specific direction from the state to help provide a consistent effort, uh, consistent uh, delivery of the commissioning effort on the project. Now, you can see the, uh, the local firms there, those three large boxes on the bottom are surrounded by the smaller boxes. Those represent uh, the 30 buildings, 30 plus buildings that are on this site. And it may look lopsided, but in fact, this was, uh, um, this was set up um, very specifically uh, with <clears throat> taking into account the manpower, the capacity of each of these firms, and the size of the buildings, and the uh, accelerated schedule. There were a lot of these buildings that were um, constructed at the same time. A lot, of, a lot of the commissioning efforts overlapped. So the state put a lot of effort into it, and we, we, uh, we assisted in that effort as well to plan out the flow of this commissioning. And so. Sorry to interrupt, but it's also based on the individual firm's staffing and mm -hmm. what they had experience with, right? So you can imagine the medical building got the firm that had more experience in the medical um, realm, more medical experience than other buildings. So it wasn't just, just about manpower and staffing, but it also was expertise, expertise within that firm and within the individuals that were going to be put on the job site. Right. So it, w it was our job to make sure, to help make sure it, it all went down the same so, so that we didn't get 
uh, you know, and each of these firms had multiple commissioning agents working for them on the ground as well. So there might have been a dozen of us out there working, and the state wanted it to be similar no matter who was doing it. So it was, uh, it was Todd and I's job to help make sure everybody was on the same page and doing things the same way, which was quite challenging at times. But I think, I think in the end, it's, it's uh, been successful. So, and one of the things that has led directly to our success in this effort is the fact that this is a paperless project. This was a goal set forth by the state early in the project that they wanted to um, diminish the use of paper. And uh, personally, I'm, I, I can appreciate that they did that. I have, I've been on, I've produced mountains of paperwork on prior, you know, previous commissioning jobs. So it was kind of a relief to get away on a project this size from all the paperwork. So we brought uh, our commissioning platform um, we also brought our fault detection software. The owner brought in a collaborative PDF platform, which we use extensively at the uh, initiation of the project for collaborating on design reviews, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a bit. The uh, general contractor brought their construction management uh, platform. And I'm sure that you, all of you probably recognize all of these names here, but uh, they told me not to say any names. so. Um, the, the construction management software was actually really critical, played a critical role in the project and kept everyone um, coordinated and on the same page, especially when we're talking about design documents uh, and changes that were being issued on the fly almost daily. Some of, the, some of these buildings had upwards of five, six hundred changes or RFIs, things that we needed to stay on top of and, and that software really played a key role in allowing us to stay up to speed with the ongoing changes. Um, you know, um, one other thing while you have that slide up there with the CMS system, um, in the beginning of the project, the prison itself, the whole, all their different prisons switched to a new CMS system. So we were sort of a guinea pig in terms of how to set that up correctly and how to transmit our, our translate our, our commissioning information directly into the CMS so that it would work properly the first time. We were involved in surveying. Um, there are other prisons to see how they did operations. Um, it's also the, what their equipment looked like in other buildings and other, other facilities so that we could set this up correctly as they, as they did this project. So it was another thing that we did as part of the commissioning management is look at you know, how they were going to turn the building over four years prior to turning it over. So that was a really cool piece to this program. So Right. So, yeah, so the, uh, the CMMS software is really the end goal of the whole part of the commissioning effort, right, is that all of this documentation get fo gets, uh, or at least the equipment information gets folded into that CMMS system. But in any case, this, all of these uh, digital platforms really made it possible for us to go paperless and to stay really well coordinated, which was a uh, kind of a breath of fresh air, especially on a project this size. It was worked out really, really well. Um, you know, at the beginning of the project, um, before the commissioning agents came on board, um, they, they came on at functional testing. That's not true. They came in, came on at the end of the construction phase. So they did uh, site observations, checklists, functional tests. All of the commissioning tasks prior to that, the commissioning management team took care of, um, like design reviews and submittal reviews. So in the in the design review process, we had, you know, probably 12 dozen uh, subject matter experts from both of our companies: mechanical, plumbing, electrical, communication. Um, security and envelope even. Um, and we used the PDF sessions to review each of the buildings on site. There was, remember there was more than 30. And every building went through three uh, design reviews for design development, schematic design, and construction design, excuse me, construction documents. Um, that, was a, that was a really cool effort too because um, all of the commenters could see every, every other commenter's reviewer's comments. Uh, we weren't playing this game of forwarding emails around and having people try to uh, tag their comments onto the drawings and, and getting mismatched. Everybody was in the session together. At the end of the design review session, the uh, designers actually held a live, a final live session to go through each of the comments individually and uh, talk about them, accept them, question them, answer questions. Um, it was really a deep dive into the design reviews. <clears throat> I kind of feel bad for the designers because there was there was a lot of people picking at their at their designs. But in the end, um, it was really good effort. 
and and uh, all of it was cloud-based and, and uh, collaborative. Now the submittal process, which I'm sure everyone here is familiar with, uh, the standard submittal review process. It was a little changed. <clears throat> it be, it became uh, a little bit of a hybrid system here for us due to the accelerated uh, delivery schedule of the project. So they actually, the owner removed the commissioning team from the formal submittal review process. So the submittals would go directly to the design team. The design team would review them within a matter of a day or two um, and send those out. We would receive the submittals um, after they were already reviewed and accepted. So at that point, we would still perform a review um, on these submittals as we use them to build functional tests and checklists, but our, our method uh, or our route for uh, resolving you know, any serious problems we found was a little bit uh, wonky. So what we had to do was if we came up with a serious question about the submittals that had already been accepted, we had to uh, run that right up the flagpole to the owner's representative. They would consult with us and determine whether it was a, a serious issue or not and then help us find a way to resolve it. <clears throat> One of the problems I think we found is that uh, the weight of the air handlers that were being provided exceeded the structural uh, calculations, and so they had to go back in and, and do some, uh, re I don't think they actually had to redesign any roofs, but they did have to run the calcs again, make sure that the, uh, the new approved um, air handlers were, would be safe on those roofs. Um, so another, aspect of this project, which I'm, I'm sure plays into every project, but even more so on a project of this, comp this complexity, is the quality control and assurance program. Now, commissioning is part of that program, uh, or is part of the QAQC effort, I think we all know. But I think we also all know that it's not our responsibility to provide the QAQC for, for the project. That, that really falls on the head of the uh, general contractor, and on this project, the owner's consultant, the BDK group, also um, played a, a big role in that uh, program. We contributed to the quality uh, of the installs by using our standard commissioning tools, right? We did the site observations, we used our checklists, um, functional tests, obviously. We also um, did an analysis of the specifications for the systems that would be commissioned and pulled out uh, a matrix of deliverables, of required deliverables. And I think that really helped the uh, contracting team focus on uh, what they needed to do to meet the spec requirements. So, um, <clears throat> now in general on this project, the Q, you know, the quality control was pretty good, but because of the massive scope and this accelerated schedule. We had a variety of contractors on each of these buildings. And a lot of the buildings got the A team, uh, and unfortunately some of the buildings got you know, what we would call the D team. Um, in general, the quality was good, but there were some cases where our commissioning team showed up on site uh, and things weren't ready, and there were problems, and uh, there was a significant amount of retesting. You know, and, uh, uh, they were minimal, but we did have some occasions where the commissioning team was um, approved to send back charges to the contractors. Um, but in general, the quality for the project was overall good. One of the unique features of, um, of the campus that we as a commissioning management team were responsible for testing and vetting was a site-wide standby and backup uh, power loss system. So every building on the site is provided with a normal power and a standby power circuit, as well as the emergency circuits. Every building has a UPS, a dedicated UPS, an inverter, lighting inverter. Uh, as you would expect, like I think it was David or Greg said, you know, when the power goes down, we don't want the doors to fling open. So <clears throat> there, every building has these redundant systems, but there, for the site, there is just one uh, generator power plant system. So it's a 10 megawatt system that David talked about. There's four, two and a half, megawatt generators on site um, and they provide the emergency backup power for the site when the, when the utilities, if the utilities ever go down. Um, at the beginning of the project, we knew we would want to test this system, uh, do an integrated test, an integrated systems test on this system, but we understood also that it would be a secure campus and the accessibility to each of these buildings would be limited. So we came up with a plan to perform Mini, what we call mini blackout tests at each building individually so we could confirm 
the uh, mechanical, you know, the MEP systems functioned uh, correctly in a power loss event. So once we confirmed that at the building level during construction, then um, during our final test, integrated systems test, which actually um, will occur in, I think, four weeks, we're still planning that. But at, at the point that we do this test, uh, what we plan to have is a, a space on the campus where all of the commissioning agents can gather and watch the building systems through the uh, BAS interface. So in essence, we'll be doing um, a full blackout test across the site, monitoring everything remotely. We already have the confidence that it's gonna perform the way it should from our mini blackout test. And uh, <clears throat> then we can watch it remotely. So uh, it was kind of an interesting uh, development with that test. Uh, and I'm still excited to see it go down here in a couple of weeks. We're there, tickets too. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, there, there's also at the substation, um, the generator plant, there is a SCADA system that monitors the energy usage of the site and the energy being produced by the generators, and it, it will uh, and it can modulate or, or uh, you know, bring bring more generators online if it needs or diminish the, the capacity of the generator. So it's a, uh, it's a semi-smart system. It's interesting to watch it work. Uh, and uh, one final thing I'll talk about here is another effort the state asked us to spearhead as the commissioning management team was a campus-wide equipment tagging convention or standard. So with, with so many different pieces of equipment going in and so many different designers and so many different contractors building this uh, site, the state really wanted to provide a, a standard for all of the equipment uh, nomenclature, the equipment tagging, so that at the end of the project, we could seamlessly roll um, uh, all of the data that we collected on this equipment during during commissioning straight into the, um, the prison systems um, asset management system. So this was a this was a significant effort, uh, complicated by the fact that we were brought on to do this after several of the designs had already been completed and hit the street. So. We had to work with the um, prison officials to, to develop a building abbreviation list for each of the buildings. Then we had to work with the design team to come up with a standardized list of uh, equipment abbreviations, which believe it or not, with 20 different designers was a bit of a challenge. Once we had the standard developed, then we had to incorporate it back into those designs that were already published, which was another significant challenge. But in the end, we, we, we were successful in implementing this tagging convention on, on each of these 30 buildings um, in the design documents, then into the submittals, uh, into construction, uh, onto equipment tags, and then even into our checklists and our functional tests, all in an effort to keep the, this nomenclature and the, these equipment tags unique and uh, correctly tagged all the way through the, the process so that when we turn this project over to the uh, prison department, um, they can roll the information directly into their uh, asset management system and run with it. You could you, you can understand they have a vested interest in um, maintaining this. In fact, the whole community has a vested interest in, in uh, them being able to maintain this facility in a top-notch fashion. So um, with that, I will turn the time back over to Greg. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. All right, I'm gonna talk a little bit about FDD. Um, how many people have applied a FDD system on a commissioning project? Spattering of hands, not too many. Okay, how many people know what FDD is? A few more hands, good, good. All right, well, I'll give you the five, maybe three minutes, we're running short on time. The three minute overview. Um, so an FDD system, um, there's basically three components to an FDD system. There's a data aggregation layer, and that's where you're bringing all of your data sources up into a common platform. So that, that could be your building automation system data, your energy information system data, it could be utility bills, could be weather data, whatever you want. Um, you know, in this particular project, we also had um, data flowing to and from the CMMS system as well. Um, but all that data then gets ho um, housed into a database. On top of that, you've got your data analytics engine. That engine is basically looking at that data, looking for issues, looking for optimization opportunities, 
those types of things, but it's doing that constantly. So you constantly have this intelligent computer, or it's, it's really not an intelligent computer, just a computer, right, looking at that data. Where the intelligence comes from is what system you're using. Some systems out there allow you to program whatever you want into that platform, so then you can bring your own intelligence to the table. Some come prepackaged. But whatever that intelligence is, that analytics engine is searching, kind of mining for issues, mining for opportunities. On top of that, then you have your visualiz visualization layer. Sorry, a little tongue-tied there. Um, and that visualization layer is kind of where the rubber hits the road, right? Um, you need to drive value from this data. So you need to get the data out into a format that is useful to either the commissioning agent your monitoring-based commissioning team or the facility management team or whoever else is using the system. So that's fault detection and diagnostic systems in a nutshell. The three-minute version. Two-minute version, maybe. Um, this is an example, so, so full disclosure, I mean, I, I know we're not supposed to be, say names, but this is SkySpark, right, I think. For those of you who raised your hands and were familiar with FDD, this is, this is what we deployed on on, on the prison project, so it's deployed throughout the campus, and this is um, this is a, a view into their Spark engine, basically. And so wherever you see a colored bar up there, you've got an issue. This is the Men's Max facility, so it's I think it's labeled A, which is the nomenclature that Steve was talking about. Um, but it's the Men's Max facility for the month of February, so about a month and a half ago. Uh, where you see those solid bars, they're solidly having issues. Um, I know you can't read um, some of those rules, but those are some of those are like temperature performance issues, terminal unit issues, uh, where we're where we're working through issue resolution. So uh, we're starting at the major pieces of equipment and then working up through the terminal units. So getting those air handlers working well, getting the hot water systems working really well, and then we move into the terminal units. Um, the other things to take away from this too is um, these systems will create a lot of information. They're going to throw a ton of information and they will bury you if you're not careful. So prioritization is really important. This allows you to, in, in, in this intelligence that you put into these systems, you can, you can create um, rules that will look for comfort issues or temperature performance. It'll look for energy efficiency opportunities. It could be an O&M issue. And then you can put levels of uh, importance under each of those categories. You can put um, energy savings in there. So you can prioritize by all those different things. So you're hitting what's important to whomever your customer is. And that's, that's critical, because otherwise you're going to get buried in the information. Um, the, the next thing, so getting in front of it. So this is kind of a lesson learned over quite a few years in, in implementing FDD on projects. Um, and there, there's two things that I, I want to hit on that I think are really important. One is the procurement model. How do you, how do you get it? Um, we're lucky in the state of Utah, which is interesting. People don't think of Utah as a progressive place, right? I didn't when I moved there 20 years ago. Um, but I also saw opportunity. But anyway, any rate, that's another story. Um, we're lucky at the state of Utah. Uh, we've got somebody in the government um, who is a great, huge fan, big proponent of FDD systems. Um, we kind of introduced it to her probably eight, ten years ago, something like that. Um, during an issue resolution conversation, we were able to bring the data of an issue in front of the control contractor. And that control contractor, there was no arguing, there was no finger pointing. They looked at the data. They said, yeah, we got to get that fixed. And since then, she's been a proponent of that. As her career has progressed, she's now um, in a position that she's requiring this on all state facilities. Um, and it's, it's part of the commissioning agent scope. So it's part of the commissioning agent scope to deploy and use an FDD tool for all state buildings over a certain size. And so, so we've had really good success with that procurement model. I've also experienced it in either Division 23 or Division 25. Um, and that works as well, and I've had good experiences and bad experiences with that. Um, the key point, I think, for us as the commissioning community is to understand that needs to be part of the commissioning spec. So that needs to be commissioned, because you're going to get some providers that are good at put setting up an FDD system and some providers that are not good at setting up an FDD system. And somebody needs to be watching out on the owner's behalf. The last bullet, which is probably the most important bullet, and it's, I don't, there's not a whole lot to that bullet, but it's the IT conversation. This is really, um, John mentioned it earlier when in his conversation um, 
this morning, but this is probably one of the most challenging aspects is how to get data out of the building. So, and it starts right here. So you have to engage the IT departments. On this particular project, it was pretty complicated. Um, there actually were two IT departments. There was the Utah Department of Corrections IT department, and then there was the state of Utah IT department. So we were having these IT uh, meetings with roughly, uh, roughly 20 people on the call, all from each different department, each with unique roles. And it took quite a while to actually figure out who we needed to be talking to to get these meetings rolling in the first place. So the effort, um, uh, it, 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 I just can't under, you know, underemphasize how important it is to, to get these going as early as possible. Um, a, little, a little story on the side, she just told me I have 10 minutes, so I'll keep talking a little bit longer. Um, we did under, uh, identify a couple coordination issues that were, that were a little bit surprising. Um, there, nobody, there was, there was just kind of a procurement of the, or who was providing the network switches, who was providing the network cabling, and who was installing the network cabling kind of got dropped. One department kind of pointed the finger at the other department, and then the GC was saying, well, I thought you guys were providing it. And they were like, oh, no, I thought you were providing it. So we got into the middle of these IT conversations, and all of a sudden we realized, oh, there's not going to be a network for us to get data out of. Because if you, if you understand a network, you need to have a, well, you need to have cabling, right? Everybody knows that. But you also need to have a switch. If you don't have a switch, you don't have a network. And then you can't get data. You can't connect your systems. You can't talk to your systems. You can't get data out of your systems. Big issue for the control contractor, because they had to be on site at each controller to program it as opposed to doing it remotely. So they actually stepped up to the plate and said, all right, well, we're bringing in some temporary switches and some temporary cabling to get this thing working so that we can actually start our work because otherwise we're going to get run over by this project. So here's a picture of what the IT architecture looks like. Um, kind of moving left to right, there are some boxes on there that got a little bit washed out. but. You can see the buildings in the lower left. So that's just all of your instrumentation in your building. It's your sensors, it's your, you know, your controllers, what have you. Going up to the, to the, the building switch, and then it's tying into a, um, the campus server. Which So the, the controller architecture is interesting. I don't know that we mentioned that in that much detail, but um, this, this PLC BAS type of, it's a, it's a PLC Niagara combination where we're actually, to kind of keep everybody happy <laughs> early on in the project, we ended up uh, installing uh, Phoenix Contact PLCs, which um, speak really well with a Niagara system. So the facility management got their PLCs on all of the major pieces of equipment, um, and we were able to save a whole bunch of money by installing kind of typical BAS controls out at the VAB level. Um, and then it all ties into a Niagara front end. And so at the, at the campus level, we've got the Niagara front end, but then you can see kind of the path of firewall. So that goes from the UDC network. So the prison's on our left half side, and then it moves over to the state network. And then from the state network, you've got a couple other firewalls that you have to navigate through until you're up into the state managed AWS cloud. And that's where the, the data or the source of truth is stored. So. So that was the architecture, and that was, um, we figured that out, and we figured out who was responsible for what over many minutes of conversations. Um, this was the result of that uh, coordination issue where the building networks weren't up and running and ready to go for us to start grabbing data from or for the control contractors to be doing their remote programming. Um, you can see a little device there on the right. Um, that's actually a Tossie box um, that's creating a direct VPN up into our cloud. So that was our temporary solution. So as these buildings started coming on, online in the fall, we had to deploy this temporary solution. I think the permanent network came online in maybe January, February timeframe, and then we were able to start moving forward on that other network. So how did we leverage FDD during the functional testing process? I, I think the big, the big piece of this is 100% sampling at the terminal units. We were, still, um, we were still out functionally testing all the major pieces of equipment. We had boots on the ground doing that. But we gave this as a tool to all, the, to all of the CXAs so that they could hit and identify issues with those terminal units. And there were quite a few. And then they would go out and val validate those issues with boots on the ground. But it wasn't random sampling. It was based on data. 
Um, and then it's a useful tool for the back check process, right? So a lot of times you can just go in and go, okay, you know, the contractor says it's fixed, let me go look, data says it is fixed, data says it's not fixed, and you can coordinate from there. Saves you a little bit of time from getting on site. Uh, this is a pre-verification test that we actually created in the platform. Um, this is a, it's a, it's a 12 hour test. This, this is what would, did the 100% sampling for us. So it's, it basically scripts over a 12 hour period. The VAVs all go into a cooling mode, they go into a satisfied mode, they go into a heating mode. And then we've got analytics that are running in the background that are testing in each of those phases. This report then identifies the piece of equipment, the rule that's hitting, how many hours that rule was hitting, so how many hours that problem is occurring, when it's occurring, and then it gives you some idea of what action to take. This was usually a multi-page report initially during the, the, the test. Um, so after the, FD, the functional testing process, we move into a monitor-based commissioning process. So this is, this is where we're starting to get into the, the, the details. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the FDD platform can really identify a lot of issues in a building. Our monitoring-based commissioning team starts to work with the facility management team, so one, they learn how to use the tool, and two, they can start working on um, improving facility operation and maintaining facility operation. Um, I've got a little story on an SA, a, a sequence of operation issue that we found, but we're, we're kind of running short on time, so um, ask me later if you want to hear about that. Uh, this is an example of uh, an issue report that we send out um, uh, monthly. So basically, we'll, we, we've learned that you don't want to overwhelm people with issues. And I, I, it's a kind of a recurring theme as I'm listening to myself speak up here. But if you give somebody 50 issues that they have to fix, they're not going to get anywhere. But if you give them about five, uh, we've found that they make pretty good progress. And then you repeat it. You kind of rinse and repeat. So you give them five issues. You give them some good detail about what needs to be fixed. And then uh, we also you know, prioritize these issues based on savings potential. So that you know, dollars always help. And then, we, and then we rinse and repeat. And we do this for every facility every month. Along with the issues report, we've got a couple KPI reports. Uh, the first one is, uh, it's called Comfort up there, but I think we need to rename it to Temperature Performance or something like that. Comfort just sounds wrong for a facility like this. But very important for this facility. Um, Prisoners have, you know, rights, and one of those is temperature. You know, you can't have a too cold or too hot of a facility. If that happens, and that happens when HVAC system fails, HVAC systems fail, um, the state can get sued, and that can be a lot of money, a lot of time, and a big problem. Here we can quickly see how we're we doing as far as temperature performance. You can look at a KPI on a monthly, daily weekly basis to really understand how are, how is my building performing performing in, te in terms of temperature. And, and then the other nice piece is all of this data that is flowing into this KPI calculation is archived. So that goes back to that source of truth up in the cloud. And when somebody comes back three years later and say, hey, my client had these temperature issues, we can go back and say, no, we've got the data. Um, that wasn't an issue or, oh yeah, we're in trouble. That was an issue. Uh, we also show, um, we also provide a reheat report. So this, this identifies like an area to, to target for energy efficiency improvements. So if you're reheating all the time, you've probably got an issue with uh, your space load not matching your design airflows. And so you're over, over ventilating or providing too, too much cold air into the space and you have to reheat it. So if you see something that's always hit on the top of the list of the reheat, reheat KPI, it's a target for improving performance. Uh, quick. Quick shot of a workflow. Um, basically, what, what this is, is this is a condensed um, dashboard that allows the facility management team to really quickly use that FDD platform, selecting pieces of equipment, time frames. It, it brings in the work order information so that you can actually see if there's open work orders on a particular piece of equipment or not. And then it also brings in your data and your, and your analytic information all in one spot. So what's next? I mean, we've talked about the early schedule. Um, the, the, the interest, you know, so we're moving in a year, year and a half earlier than expected. Um, the challenge is there's going to be a lot of issues. There's going to be a lot of open issues that we haven't been able to get to. The schedule on this thing got compressed and, and things move faster than we would have liked. And now we're going to have to work in a locked down facility. So the value of the FDD and all of the, our ability to get that data out of this building just went through the roof, if that makes sense. Because we're going to be able to do a lot of issue identification and root cause analysis 
remotely. And, and we don't have to be out in a secured facility with prisoners looking over our shoulders and a guard there as well. It's a very uncomfortable position to be in if you've ever been <laughs> doing any kind of that work in a prison. We can do this remotely. We can do a lot of that remotely. And uh, we will be continuing to provide the monitoring-based commissioning service to get their facility management team educated and up and running on the, on the platform so that they can operate a state-of-the-art facility for our community. And with that, I think we're out of time. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate the attention. Thank you.